we the people of the United States of America. We the people of the United States of America, in order to form a more perfect union, establishing justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, to promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish the Constitution for the United States of America. The Constitution of the United States of America stands firm as the fundamental law of land, law that defines the form and the power of the national government, which is the federal governing body of United States. Citizens united in faith to form a more perfect union who delegates standards of law to states, laws to be followed for the best welfare of the people based on one true God's standards from the Holy Bible. Native Indian and Pilgrim united under one God Jehovah and his son Jesus Christ as king in our hearts and minds selecting one man as a princely principal rule in guidance from the great spirit Jehovah God. Standards of the United States based on Holy Bible which equals national values, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, not to impose on our national values, freedom, a balance of free will, given by God, choices. Choice of life without sin equals law and order, freedom of the press, keeping people informed of truth, open communication for people and the government, freedom in a peaceful manner of the best well-being of the people of the United States of America, for the people, by the people, for the protection of the people, and future generations. Many people would say the Founding Fathers were political geniuses, but in all reality, they were Bible scholars, educated men that knew the detailed information of the Bible. They had a full understanding of Jehovah God's will. Men of true faith with intentions of protecting the innocent lives of others, creating a foundation, government, united with Jehovah God. We have had many intruders into the land of the free, America, out to manipulate and break our unity with Jehovah God. Every system created for the people, the intruders find a way to get into, to manipulate events to their best interest. Example is John Quincy Adams, became president 1825, an Irishman. He was caught trying to change the wording of the American Constitution. He was also caught with the dead man's facial skin in his hands. He was executed 1825. Martin Van Buren never was president of the United States. He campaigned, but later caught interfering with the voting process and at that time the voting process was used through the mail system time and again we have shown the world what a free community can do when we get our backs up and carve out another step of a better future for ourselves some of it is an old story like flood control Today the child is overwhelmed with experiences, impressions, and attitudes, even before he goes to school. Formal education will continue to add new ideas, but it must also bring order and perspective and selectivity to what is already present. The school and college must help the individual learn how to sort out the flood of information pouring in from the mass media, to separate the true from the false, the important from the trivial. Expecting our country to move ahead without the chance for a fair profit is like expecting an automobile to run without gas or oil.
The expectation of profits led investors and businessmen to seek newer and better fabrics, refrigerators, washing machines, and thousands of other articles. Billions of dollars plowed back into industry helped it expand at an astonishing rate. Profits make products. Profits create jobs. Profits mean progress. Let's ensure tomorrow's jobs and living standards by encouraging the quest for profits instead of discouraging it through high and discriminatory taxes. Another benchmark, and it is visible on every engine and assembly line since then, is Eli Whitney's. Not for the cotton gin, but for his theory of the interchangeability of parts. And later spread to every industry in the country. Originally called the Whitney System, it later took on a more imposing title, Mass Production. Whitney's first breakthrough had stemmed from the solution to an intellectual puzzle. His second, from a desire to succeed in business. In 1805, he built the first rifle factory. It was the method of production, more than the product itself, that marked Whitney's success. All the weapons parts were uniform and interchangeable. A radical break from the old method of making each rifle one by one. The system begun in Whitney's small factory was adopted by Samuel Colt in his own firearms works. Was to put the new spinning and weaving machines into mills where they could be run by the power from a water wheel. Here was a second problem for the men of the Industrial Revolution. The question of power. They had revolutionized the method of making cloth. The next step was to find a better source of power to run their machines. The new source of power was the steam engine. James Watt patented one of the first successful steam engines. The use of steam was the first new source of power in thousands of years. One of the first uses for steam engines could be used to pull a train. Here was a new kind of transportation. Steam trains that moved on steel rails. And the third great change the improved method of manufacturing iron and steel meant that great quantities of steel rails could be produced for a growing network of railroads. Steel ships could be built to carry on a worldwide commerce. And more and better engines and machines could be built of iron and steel. And so the Industrial Revolution opened the way to a new age of machines. More than one half of America's 60 million working men and women are now employed in business and industries that didn't even exist 50 years ago. These new frontiers of work and achievement have been opened up in industries like chemicals, electronics, automotive and atomic energy, all resulting from our unmatched research programs and our genius at invention, all possible only under our individual enterprise system. Our nation's constantly expanding industrial and business horizons offer high hope for the youth of our country. America is still the land of opportunity. 
Population experts tell us we'll number 220 millions by 1975, 60 millions more than now. These new Americans will need many things, and today's luxuries will be tomorrow's necessities. Machine development will make this dream a reality. In addition to goods of every description, Americans in 1975 will need more jobs to support an expanding population. Can we have wonderful and more efficient machines and jobs in increasing numbers at the same time? The history of industry says we can. The practice of industry says we will. America's future depends on our ability to unlock our resources and discover new sources of energy. Ohio is an energy company, and we present this science screen report as an example of our commitment to the advancement of science and technology. Four of every ten are women. Professional workers, up 50% in the last decade, have been increasing faster than any other occupational group. Continuing rapid growth is expected generally with moderate or little or no growth in a few individual professions such as teaching in the elementary and secondary schools. It is possible for professional workers to earn large incomes, not all, but many. Generally, professional people are highly respected, and they have the satisfaction of knowing that their work is important to society. Pioneers became the men and women of industry. A humming web of work covers the land, joining worker with worker in pride, dignity, warmth. Industry on Parade goes south to Atlanta to learn about the newest development in writing instruments. The ballpoint pen has long since established itself. Now comes the ballpoint pencil. Manufacture of the pencil that never needs sharpening begins here at Scripto Incorporated with the molding of the plastic barrels. The barrels emerge from the mold, linked together in groups of eight. The fluid graphite pencils, incidentally, retain the hexagonal shape traditional with conventional pencils. Four at a time, the barrels are stamped with the trademark. After this, the barrels can be snipped apart. This plant is one of the few that depends on no outside suppliers for any of the parts of its products. Even the tiny balls for the ball points are ground and polished here on the premises. They are minute spheres of stainless steel. Every one must be individually inspected under a microscope before it is accepted for use in a pen or pencil. Rejects are sucked off by vacuum. All other metal parts are fabricated in this department. These are the replaceable cartridge tubes. This is the clip that holds the pencil in one's pocket. The clutches that hold the ball point in writing position until released and then retracted into the barrel are made on this strange looking device. But even more interesting is the machine that automatically performs all operations on the tip of the pencil. It drills a hole, introduces a ball, closes the sides to retain the ball, then drills the tiniest of holes to admit air and exude the liquid lead. The capsules that hold the lead inside the cartridge tubes are made of vinyl plastic. This gal, cutting them to length, would do very well in a spaghetti factory. Now assembly begins. Actually, of course, it has been going on simultaneously, for the plant has been operating full blast, trying to fill the worldwide channels of distribution. That's a project requiring many months 
when a new product like this is first introduced. The barrels with clips attached are inserted in a special conveyor and the other parts are added in turn. It's a good demonstration of the concept of interchangeability of parts, the basis of our American system of mass production. Industrial research develops the new products. Mass production turns them out at prices everyone can afford. Materials into finished cloth. These machines use the same process that spinners have always used, either with a spinning wheel or with more crude methods. A process which spins the fibers into threads on thousands of spindles. Long banks of machine looms weave the threads into cloth with the aid of the flying shuttle. It's easy. Easy to love the different pineapple grapefruit drink. Stokely's finest P-I-N-G ping. A new exciting flavor. The pure juice of preferred Hawaiian pineapples blended with the pure juice of luscious tree-ripened grapefruit. Ping is vitamin C enriched. Vitamin C, the sunshine vitamin that's so important in building healthy, strong bones and teeth. Ping contains added amounts of vitamin C, even more than in fresh squeezed juice. Thirsty? Enjoy Stokely's Ping. Refreshing, satisfying, better for you. Ping for breakfast, a wonderful way to start the day. Ping for lunch a refreshing appetizer, or ping for dinner. It's so sparkling delicious. No other drink tastes quite like it. Stokely's finest ping. That's P-I-N-G. P-I-N for pineapple, G for grapefruit. Delicious, healthful ping from Stokely Van Camp. Look through a jungle swamp. Should we cross it, Cheerio King? What could possibly stop us? How about a nasty old alligator? He has a point. Down, Sue. I'll handle this. But you forgot your... Cheerios. Big G, little O means go with Cheerios. Tasty O's of oats toasted crisp all through. A Cheerios breakfast is packed with muscle-making protein. And go, go, go! See you later, alligator. Remember, the big G stands for goodness. Big G, little O, means go with the goodness of Cheerios. You forgot something, kid? Right. More Cheerios. I'll never smile again. That's my line. Oil and oil products have made their impact on our American way of life. Still, there were new and growing demands for the early crude oil refined into kerosene for the lamps of Grandfather's Day. On the sprawling plantations of Hawaii, one-seventh of America's sugar supply is grown. The freshly harvested sugar cane, loaded in huge trucks, is hauled to nearby plantation mills where it will be converted into raw sugar. At the central storage plant in Hilo, Hawaii, the raw sugar awaits shipment to the mainland. An elaborate system of automatic conveyor belts feeds the sugar on its way to a ship berthed outside the plant. A weighing mechanism measures the tons of sugar cascading by on the ship loading belt. Outside, a steady stream of sugar is fed into a long tube and then sprayed into the hold of the ship. Every nook and cranny is filled by an apparatus controlled by a mast operator who sits atop the mounting pile of sugar. The tumbling torrent is spread evenly and packed solidly. From the palm tree dotted shores of Hawaii, fast freighters deliver the crystal cargo to the refinery at Crockett, California. This elevator shaft is used for unloading. An inner chain of buckets carries the sugar to the top where it spills onto a conveyor belt. 
Inside, the raw sugar is piled into 10,000 ton white mountains to await processing. Although some may look different, every grain of sugar is exactly alike in crystal form, regardless of size. Small white cubes parade by on their way from the drying oven to be readied for packaging. This is only one of many refined products of cane sugar, Hawaii's crystal sunshine, a vital source of energy for all life. Naples and Hammondsport at the south ends of Canandaigua and Cayuca are centers of the wine industry. We had always been impressed by the quality of New York State wines. On a tour of the vineyards and wineries, we found out why they're so good. The region is ideally suited for the growth of wine grapes. This is because of a unique combination of climate and soil and the lake's warming influence in the fall which enables the grapes to be harvested at exactly the right moment. The grapes are pulled down the steep slopes of the vineyards on horse-drawn sleds. Wine making is a precise but unseen skill. Just the proper amount of aging, filtering, and blending must occur before the wine is bottled. Champagne requires even greater care than still wine because a second fermentation must take place in the bottle. For weeks, each bottle is turned every day so that the sediment will collect at the neck of the bottle. The sediment is frozen and removed before the bottle is finally corked. Fine wines from the Finger Lakes are enjoyed all over the backwoods country in the province of Quebec, Canada, with the chopping of trees and the gathering of logs, begins the story of newsprint, the paper that is used in magazines, newspapers, and in the pages of your textbooks. In the battle of ideas between the free world and communism, newsprint holds a unique role. On its production depends much of the space available for today's ideas and tomorrow's news. Pulp wood is the raw material for the manufacture of newsprint, and it is in Canada, where the largest virgin forests in the world are found, that almost 60% of the world's supply of newsprint is produced. All winter long, the timber is cut, trimmed, sawed, and stacked along the frozen rivers and lakes where they await the spring thaw. When the ice melts, the waterways become the routes on which the logs will make their long trek to the mill. In the wider bodies of water, the pulpwood collects into huge floating islands of logs, which are boomed off into sacks or sections. Boats and nimble-footed log drivers guide the cargo downstream. The fast-stepping drivers go at this pace for hours, and often the going gets rough. The logs shoot down a sluiceway as they near the mill. At the site, the logs are funneled to a common waiting place, and soon they'll go through the magic process to become newsprint. From these vast acres of logs, pulpwood will become paper in a modernized version of an ancient method. For the Chinese manufactured paper 2,200 years ago, and the Arabs soon learned the practice. In the 12th century, during the conquest of Spain by the Moors, paper was first introduced to Europe. It was made from flax and had a thick linen parchment-like quality. Logs are saturated and the bark is removed. The wood is then ground and soaked in a sulfurous solution, yielding a bleached pulp that is fed to the paper machine. The pulp is shaken on a screen, forming a web of the fibers, which is then dehydrated, smoothed, and pressed into paper. Wound in rolls, the vital newsprint is ready for shipment to all corners of the globe where freedom of the press exists. Truth is a powerful weapon in the free world's arsenal, and no tyranny can long withstand its power.
lumber industry, operators run the machines that take the bark off freshly cut logs. Other process workers make composition boards or plywood. This is the timber area. I was stirred by the magnitude of the logging and lumber operations. The gifts of nature in any land are the raw materials with which that nation builds its own way of life. And out of the things it makes are woven the fabric of its contacts with other nations all over the world. But most important is the character which these things build in its people. I'm Walter Cronkite. You're about to see a report on the highlights of IBM in 1957, as captured by our news cameras at plants, laboratories, offices, and homes of IBM people. This has been another year of progress and growth for members of the IBM family. The year has seen phenomenal increases in sales, in physical facilities, and in individual advancement. Capital raised by the issue of new stock helped support an increase in sales to a record $1 billion. Physical expansion from Vermont to California, from Minnesota to Texas, brought new productive capacity to the fast-growing company. We're going to see some of these accomplishments in the next few minutes, and also something of what the year has meant to a number of IBM people. For progress at IBM is primarily the progress of the 83,000 individuals at home and abroad who are the company. A major theme of the year was developed by President Thomas J. Watson, Jr., when he appeared before employees at plant locations. Our cameras take you now to Poughkeepsie, New York, and Mr. Watson. The attitude that made us grow from 1914 to 1940 
This was essentially a small company attitude. I like to call it that today. An attitude where everybody's business was everybody else's. When one person was in trouble, everybody wanted to pitch in. When something was wrong, it didn't matter who discovered it. The man responsible, his associate, a fellow just walking through. We had that feeling of let's make this company better because it belongs to every one of us. Now, that's the sort of thing, ladies and gentlemen, that we're going to have to do in the future if we want the company to continue to progress. And if we as a company can exhibit that same attitude in dealing with our people, the attitude that makes you all think that the IBM company is willing to go out of its way to improve the operation of anyone in it, then, then we will continue to have the small company attitude and 10 years from now, everybody in this room will have a job so much better than what you presently have that it will bear no semblance to the work we're doing today. One example of this small company attitude is the IBM Scholarship Program. Fifty young people each year will be awarded a four-year scholarship in memory of the founder of the company. Twenty-five of them sons and daughters of IBMers. Let's look at one of these young people typical of the winners across America from Los Angeles to Boston, from Galveston to Niagara Falls. Our cameras take you to Endicott, New York. Now, the word think has been associated with your company for a long time. Is the introduction of these new computers and so forth going to reduce the necessity for thinking? Well, uh, that's a hard question to answer uh, in a short phase. It will reduce the requirement for drudgerous, repetitive, non-creative thinking. But it certainly, I think, will, will increase the opportunity for men to think on the imaginative, creative lines. I'm referring particularly to men who up to this time have been doing repetitive bookkeeping tasks where the ability to create and to think new thoughts, put two known thoughts together and come out with a new third thought. But I think a good deal of this human element at the moment is, is semi-useless. The humans are being used as messenger boys, and we could just as well do that with electric wires when the process becomes sophisticated enough. Well, are you not worried that as a result of all of these new processes uh, that the human will be downgraded somewhat in society as a whole? No, well, I think quite the opposite will be true, Mr. Morrow. A lot of people call these machines giant brains, and whenever I hear, hear the term, it makes me shudder. Because they are giant, giant tools, they're certainly not giant brains. And if you have good tools, you're upgrading man, not downgrading him. I might say that recently in Italy, after a full day's debate on the part of some 24 different nations about what automation was going to do to Europe and the common market, and with great optimism for the use of automation, an Italian by the name of Pirelli who was head of a large rubber company in Italy, stood up before the audience and said, let's remember that automation is a process caused and governed by man. And let's never forget the man in the proposition. Man has created automation, man uses it, man benefits by it, and he closed by suggesting that we as humans shouldn't get the lights in the streets so bright that we couldn't see the stars. I liked it. So do I. Thank you very much, Mr. Watson. Thank you, Mr. Murrow. Part of progress is physical expansion. To help meet the spiraling demand for IBM products, the company had six plants under construction in 1957. By year's end, there were 200,000 square feet of additional manufacturing area at San Jose, California, as well as new education and engineering buildings. At Sherman, Texas, a new card manufacturing plant was completed and in production. In Burlington, Vermont, a plant to manufacture computer components was completed and in production. Rochester, Minnesota, 400,000 square feet of manufacturing area for data processing equipment, two-thirds complete. For a look at other new IBM plants across the country, our cameras take you first to Lexington, Kentucky. The world of the ski boom is a magnetic, exhilarating place. A progressive existence that never quite repeats itself. In the past ten years, the number of skiers in the United States has tripled. 
Construction is up on gondolas and chairlifts, hotels and condominiums, developing new resort areas and improving on those already established. Why do the people come? What's the attraction? What is it about these mountains along the spine of Western America during the winter? Easterners dream about it. Europeans envy it. Dry, cold snow with enough air to keep it from packing hard. Experts from every country claim it's some of the best skiing in the world. Snow conditions and postcard mailing weekenders or month-long vacationers. Experts or first-timers. The social or the rugged. On the mountain, a skier is a skier, young or old. The family thrives here because skiing is a great equalizer. Age and status are out the window. Father and son are both beginners with the same purpose in mind. You discover that you can enjoy skiing on any level of experience. That the bunny is reaching out to better himself just as the expert is. Always. To accomplish the basic snowplow can be a rewarding achievement. To conquer it together is to make the sweetness of life. 